give it one more minute here. Looks like a few more folks are filtering in. Hey, Ross, this is Jim Harkness. Can you hear me? Yeah, hey, Jim. No, I can hear you just fine. Okay, yeah, I, sorry. I, my computer forced a restart right there, so uh, I just wanted to make sure that I'm fully back up and running. Nope, you are good to go. Thanks for checking. All right, well, let's get started here. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to session 2B, the next evolution of transportation systems management and operations. My name is Ross Buchan with Kittleson and Associates, and I will be your moderator for today's session. So before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping items. So all questions should actually be funneled through the Q&A feature. I believe this session doesn't actually have a chat feature, so everything's gonna have to go through the Q&A. I will be monitoring that feature and then I will actually ask the, the questions to our speakers. And depending on time, we may be able to actually take a few questions after the first presentation. I'll make a judgment call on that and just see how we're doing on time. And then lastly, to, to save on time, since we have four speakers, I'm not going to review each of the speaker bios but they are available on the TESC website. So if you are interested, you can go out there and view those. So without further ado, let's get to the task at hand. Our first presentation is in regards to a state of the practice signal system that's being developed in the city of Pittsburgh. Mike Malak of the city of Pittsburgh and Scott Thompson Graves of Whitman Record and Associates are going to share insight on this cutting edge project. So with that said, Mike Scott, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Ross. I appreciate the introduction. So with, as a project manager for the city of Pittsburgh, I have been heavily involved with the Smart Spines, I guess for a good chunk of my career here. And without a doubt, it's probably the most exciting project I've worked on during my career as, as well as in my opinion, the most probably impactful traffic signal project for the city of Pittsburgh for a generation. And so and needless to say, like we're I'm very excited. We're very excited. And I really appreciate everyone joining this presentation today. So I would I would probably suggest that our, our journey to being smart for this project can be attributed to um, the city's 2016 Smart City Challenge application. This is when the US DOT requested that Small to mid-sized cities submit technological solutions to their unique problems. And City of Pittsburgh ended up being one of seven finalists for this grant. And, and we did not win, and that's okay. Um, however, through that challenge application, we were able to package and put together an ATC MTD grant application using that application. And in 2016, we were awarded a $10 million FHWA grant, which combined with state and local funding has led to this project, which is the development and the implementation of advanced traffic signal technology on eight corridors within the city of Pittsburgh, as well as the identification of two future corridors where this technology will ideally through a separate project be implemented. So for those of you who are not familiar with the city of Pittsburgh, here is a, here's a map of Pittsburgh. As you can see, we have the blue lines with the yellow dots are gonna be the eight future corridors. The, I guess there are dashed lines with green squares are going to be, those are the identified corridors that we're not gonna implement via this project, but for future, they're earmarked for receiving advanced signal technology. The, these corridors, are different. They are not similar. They have different typologies. They have different users. They have different needs. The, the overall characteristic that they share is that they connect the south and east suburbs to our downtown central business district, otherwise known as the Golden Triangle. You can see it there. They, there are two corridors to the south, two spines. One is West Liberty Avenue. The other is Sawmill Run Boulevard, which provide connectivity to our southern neighborhoods and suburbs. If you look at the top of your screen, there is one 
Smart Spot on Washington Boulevard, which eventually connects to Fifth Avenue. This is also right next to the Pittsburgh Zoo. And so there is, you know, tourist attraction adjacent to that spine. To the right of that, we have Penn Avenue, which provides connectivity from the eastern suburbs to the city of Pittsburgh. Center Avenue and Bigelow Boulevard are two spines that provide connectivity from the central business district to the east end of the city. And then at the bottom of your screen is Second Avenue, which is a connection between the Hazelwood neighborhood and the downtown business district. And that old stock image of a computer represents the technology site of Hazelwood Green, which is expected to, at full development, bring 4 million square feet of office space and 3 million square feet of residential space to a currently undeveloped 165 acre tract. Currently, there are a few tech clients in there now, and this, this development is monstrous. It's going to end up, I believe, adding over 8,000 vehicle trips during the PM rush. And so this corridor is especially of importance to the city of Pittsburgh. The, the two corridors I did not discuss yet are Fifth and Forbes, and they are also of special interest to the city of Pittsburgh, in part because they provide connection between the Oakland neighborhood, which is where University of Pittsburgh is located, Carnegie Mellon University is located, there are three hospitals. In our region, it's the second largest job driver aside from the central business districts. It's, it's also a good time to discuss that Fifth and Forbes Avenue are also, they overlap with the Port Authority of Allegheny County's bus rapid transit project. Also a very exciting project for the city of Pittsburgh. This is going to provide connection between the downtown central business district and the Oakland neighborhood with the development and the implementation of a bus rapid transit line. In addition to that, there are two spurs. You have Highland Park neighborhood receiving a spur at the top of your screen and Squirrel Hill neighborhood at the bottom. The green circles are traffic signals that are unique to the BRT project. And then I believe it's red are ones where there are overlap between the smart spines as well as the bus rapid transit project. The, the technology that we are going to spec, procure, and implement via smart spines is going to be what eventually drives the Port Authority's bus rapid transit system. And so for especially the past three to four months, we've been heavily involved. We are coordinating our schedules together because these projects rely on each other. The, the scope of smart spines is truly remarkable. To, to fully appreciate it, if you look at this chart, there are 143 signals that are gonna have some form of revision, be it full replacement, be it a minor upgrade, moderate upgrade. And for a city of 613 signals, this ends up being roughly a quarter of our traffic signal inventory, which you know, given the state of our infrastructure and the needs we have as a city, this project is going to be a complete game changer for the city of Pittsburgh. And I think a theme that Scott is going to get into a bit more coming up is that this Smart Spines project is not going to be simply providing, you know, the ability for vehicular traffic to use these A corridors to make it into and out of the city faster. The, the values and goals, and as we enter in the systems engineering process, is going to be shaped by the city of Pittsburgh documents, including our climate action plan, the complete streets policy, as well as our bike plus plan. We, we're going to look at these corridors from a holistic perspective and make sure that the technology that we are implementing is best appropriated for the users on that corridor, be it cyclists, pedestrians, transit users, or vehicular traffic. And so Scott's going to get a bit more into the specific components of the smart spines, as well as how um, how these plans are going to end up shaping this project moving forward. Thanks, Scott. Mike, um, as Mike indicated, um, it's kind of a unique starting place for a uh, signalized, uh, you know, signal focused uh, technology project, beginning with trying to sync up with the climate action plan, which emphasizes uh, the smooth flow of traffic, not necessarily an expedited flow of traffic. The uh, complete streets policy and the bike plus plan, which, which both uh, encourage policies to try to get as many short trips as possible um, out of single occupant vehicles and onto bikes and uh, becoming pedestrian trips. So really, you know, one of the challenges of the project was, you know, how do we develop a robust signal system to meet the needs of those plans? 
So in order to do that, what we've done is we've broken up the uh, Smart Spines project into a number of individual system components. So in, in many ways, the Smart Spines is really a system of systems that has to work together to help DOMI, uh, PANDOT, and FHWA meet the project goals. The systems include a central priority system, a central signal system, a brand new traffic management center for the city of Pittsburgh, which will be a, a, a huge investment and uh, an enhancement for the city, an advanced multimodal adaptive signal system, which we refer to as a mass system, the advanced performance metric suite, uh, traffic signal hardware and infrastructure improvements, including passive and uh, pedestrian and bike detection, an enhanced communication system and a redundant backhaul, and then connected vehicle hardware. So it's a very complex system. The first system we want to talk about was the uh, cloud-based central priority system. So one of the things that we wanted to uh, make sure that we accomplished as part of this project was to really make sure that we provided a priority system that would work with the transit agency's investment in the BRT, but also try to reduce uh, long-term maintenance. So rather than rely on additional components, antenna or uh, emitters or things like that within the vehicles, we tried to to de develop a system that would work with the infrastructure that's already in place on the vehicle. So for example, for the transit system, the central priority system will work with the already um, incorporated clever devices on the buses. The system will should work with the AVL system on the city fleet already for emergency responders. And we should be able to develop um, APIs with uh, third party um, uh, you know, users such as freight vehicles or the city's bike share, uh, uh, bicycles that could all, you know, send information to the central preempt or preemption priority software and then also receive priority um, on a scheduled basis. In addition, we've got a passive detection system. So we're bringing bikes, pedestrians, and then what uh, the city refers to as bike plus, which are uh, other alternative modes of transportation, um, you know, fully into the traffic signal system as equal. Understanding the um, state of the industry, we've got a series of planned generations of deployment. The first generation will focus on connecting the AVL systems to the central priority system, to the city's new TMC, and ultimately to the infrastructure in the field. In the first generation, we'll add the uh, adaptive signal components, <clears throat> but the central priority system will still communicate directly with the 27 controllers. By the second generation, we should be able to run the preemption and priority calls through the adaptive signal system. And then by the third generation, we would uh, rely much more heavily upon fully connected vehicles. As uh, Courtney had mentioned in, our previ in, the, in the previous presentation in this session, um, you know, we haven't really achieved full uh, market penetration for connected vehicles yet. So we wanted to acknowledge that in our deployment generations. <clears throat> Some of the differentiators between the way the system will operate versus the way the system operates today is that standard detection really doesn't differentiate between vehicles. It can detect that there's somebody waiting at the stop bar, whether it's a, you know, a bus or a taxi cab or a police car. We don't really know, but we do know there's a detect or a vehicle at the, at the intersection. And there is really no information gathered on the uh, number or the volume of pedestrians. Through the passive detection implementation, we'll be able to identify the different vehicle types that are in the street and also discreetly identify pedestrians and bikes and count the number of people so that we can use that information to help prioritize uh, traffic flow for people rather than just simply vehicles. <clears throat> Once we get to the future and we have a better or more, more robust connected vehicle market penetration, you know, we'll be able to have much better vehicles and the infrastructure in place. But in the meantime, the system will be able to uh, gather data from you know, DSRC units that are you know, being deployed in vehicles today. So we can better understand the needs, understand the data and how to process and work with it with the signal system, collect that data and then provide information back to the vehicles that uh, do have the connected technology. So what's innovative about the system? As we've mentioned a few times so far, uh, you know, we're really accounting for people rather than vehicles. So we're accounting for auto occupancy and motor vehicles, bus loadings, the numbers of pedestrians at corners, the numbers of bike plus that are located in the intersection. We're requiring the system to have a uh, modal emphasis. So the AMAS system or the um, adaptive signal system that we're gonna deploy will require the ability to change how optimization is done. So rather than using a simple unified optimization algorithm 
will have different emphasis settings by primary mode that can be schedule driven by time of day and can also be changed by the traffic management center in real time in order to best accommodate the flow of people through the system and meet the city's goals. We're also uh, really focusing on moving beyond just collecting data. So we're trying to actually use the data that can be collected to improve operations and performance reporting so we can continue to learn and enhance the system as it's implemented. So, you know, some of the data that the system will be able to use that's non-traditional data would be path data. As I mentioned before, we're going to try to tie into the uh, automatic vehicle location system that we deployed on fleet vehicles and transit vehicles, for example. So we'll be able to tell the signal system that transit vehicles want to go from intersection one through intersection two, three, and then turn right at intersection four. So the system can build that into their timing optimization. Today, most traditional traffic signals can tell you at intersection one, there's a vehicle waiting as indicated by the blue arrow and they need service. Typical adaptive signal systems, and I understand it's a simplification, but intersection one and adaptive signal system uh, deployments will tell intersection two that there'll be vehicles arriving shortly and to try to allow the signal to turn green before they get there. The MAS system will be able to ingest the path data I just described, origin destination data, um, typical the types of operations, whether it's recurring or non-recurring congestion that's being experienced by the system, and then also information on weather, which impacts the travel time that it takes to get between intersections or different modes of travel. So the uh, advanced multimodal adaptive signal system should be able to ingest all that data and take advantage of it to best optimize, uh, optimize mobility for all modes of travel. One of the questions that um, we, we always have to answer when we're de deploying a technology like this is, how do we really know it's going to work? Well, we're going to know it's going to work because it's going to have an independent performance metric suite. So rather than relying on, um, I would call it the traditional approach of, hey, we're going to deploy an adaptive signal system or other technology, and we're just going to do travel time runs before the system's deployed and then travel time runs after the system's deployed. Um, what we're going to do is actually collect real-time data that we can accumulate constantly and be able to measure how the system is operating. So we'll get real-time information on how each signal is operating compared to uh, similar data from other typical days. We'll get corridor reports that determine how each uh, uh, corridor is performing. And then Michael have the ability to produce annual reports that focus on city, state, and USDOT uh, reporting goals so that everybody can measure the success of the system going forward. <clears throat> how that'll work from a deployment standpoint is when the initial smart spines are deployed, we're going to establish all of the data collection and the communications in the background in, or the background uh, parts of the system. And we're going to collect data on the existing performance metrics at every intersection along every quarter of the system. We'll collect that data for three months. After that three month period, we'll then go a, through a system implementation and adjustment period where we deploy the uh, central priority system or the MS system. We adjust it, we get it working as best as we can, and then we'll evaluate the performance of those deployed systems for three months. If you notice that we'll have three months of deployment, nine months of adjust, or three months of data collection, nine months of adjustment, and then three months of performance, the reason to do that is we want to make sure that the performance metrics after the system is deployed is taken place during the same time period as the initial baseline metrics were taken. So we can have an apples to apples comparison of operations. Once the systems are deployed, the city will then operate and maintain the system and they'll go through an annual cycle where they evaluate the system performance, set new metrics and new goals for the subsequent year, optimize the system, deploy the system, measure it after a year. So year over year, they can continue to enhance the way that the system operates based on the performance metrics. Another part of it would be the day-to-day -day operations. So they'll be able to establish how each, each intersection along the system and each uh, you know, quarter within the system operates. <clears throat> Rather than just compare average statistics year over year, what we um, are going to do is use cluster analysis to kind of break up the traffic operations into discrete dens. So for example, you know, Mike described uh, University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University are along two of the corridors. So along those corridors, you know, move-in day creates a lot of high demand. So that might be categorized as a high demand day. 
Um, summer days, you typically see significant traffic changes around universities. At the same time, we've got the uh, you know, PPJ Paints Arena, um, also that is located along those corridors and it creates special events which influence traffic incidents on nearby uh, roadways, uh, in, in influence traffic, snow along some of the hills might influence the way traffic works. So we'll break up the operations of the intersections onto the, into these discrete bins to determine how they operate during these general conditions. What we can then do is during subsequent years, we can measure the performance of the system within each of those bins. So it won't really be influenced by the fact that you know, in year two, we had 45% typical days, whereas year one, we only had 40% typical days. What we're interested in seeing on a typical day, how's the system operating? <clears throat> what we'll be able to do is then quickly determine how the system operates and how is it improving year over year for each of these bins of traffic operations. So in this example, you can see that year two improved operations for typical days and improved operations for high demand days, but it had a negative impact on summer days. So this will allow Mike and the TMC to go back and evaluate, you know, investigate why operations got worse in some, in the summer, during the summer days and how they can improve the system so that we can improve mobility for all modes. This information will also be available to the TMC in real time. So we'll be able to categorize what type of day is currently happening in the field and how the operations are going for each mode, which can then trigger the a decision to support system within the TMC to perhaps select a different oper uh, operation in order to um, overcome any deficiencies that they're observing. So with that, that's a general summary of the, uh, you know, of the smart spine system. I can open it up to any questions or Mike, if you'd like to wrap it up. Yeah, thank you, Scott and Mike. An excellent presentation. It looks like there are two quick questions, which I, I think we have time before the next presentation. The first question, Mike, this is probably more for you. Uh, Climate action plan, question marks. I guess people are a little curious on what that means for the city of Pittsburgh. All right, there we go. Sorry, Ross. That was uh, the city of Pittsburgh plan. Scott actually probably is familiar with this too. I want to say it was passed, enacted in 2016 maybe. Um, Scott, do you have anything to add on that? It was, uh, yeah, this is, we're on version three of the climate action plan. And it was recently um, updated, I think over this summer. And uh, as part of the climate action plan, they've set a series of specific actions and goals that'll help reduce um, the impacts of, of the city and its operations on climate. And so it had a lot of actually very specific goals that uh, align very well with the smart spines, like a goal for implementing connected vehicle technology, a goal for, alternative modes of traffic. And so it had a, uh, a series of goals that actually tied pretty well into this, uh, this smart spines concept. Thanks, Scott. There was one other question then. And the question was, any privacy issues regarding O&D algorithm or is this built into some type of predictive analytics model? Yeah, there were certainly um, privacy concerns with O&D data, and that was uh, discussed. You can achieve the O&D data through a variety of different means. You can do it through license plate recognition, which would certainly have privacy uh, considerations and policies that would need to be put in place to scrub that data before it was made available. Um, you could also do that with uh, Bluetooth or with BSRC antennas. So the uh, specific way that we're going to collect that data hasn't been determined. That'll be determined through the procurement process, but it's certainly a uh, certainly a concern. It's actually the reason why we didn't go with a fully connected approach, um, where pedestrians would need to get a uh, a, a personal uh, a PID device or a uh, an app on their smartphone in order to trigger their make their presence known at an intersection. That's why we went with a passive detection system in order to try to protect people's privacy as much as possible. Excellent. Thanks, Scott. Hey, Ross, mind if I give a few quick shout outs before you move on from our presentation? No, we have a few minutes. Go ahead. Perfect. 
Um, myself and the, and the city of Pittsburgh Department of Building Infrastructure, we are a small organization and we definitely need a lot of help from our partners and stakeholders in the city to begin and also continue working on this project. Um, PennDOT District 11, especially Ed Miller and Dan Fedio have been involved with this project. I'm grateful for their expertise. Um, PennDOT Central Office, Steve Gault has definitely been a help with this project and will continue to be so. Um, Port Authority of Allegheny County, Denise Ott has been really helpful coordinating between the BRT project and Smart Spines, as well as her design team at UConn, especially the traffic leads, Jenny McCracken and Andrew Bovich. And then SPC Drive and then WRA, uh, Scott Thompson Graves has been great, as well as his team of Nicholas Streets and Dan Fritz. So I'm very grateful for everything I've done so far. I'm looking forward to working with them in the future. Thank you all. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. So now we can jump into our next presentation. So this presentation is in regards to the automated lane closure system, which is currently being deployed on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge in Maryland. Jim Harkness of Maryland Transportation Authority and Jeremy Mockney of Whitman Reckoner and Associates are going to discuss this unique TISMO system. So Jim and Jeremy, the mic is yours. Okay. Ross, thank you very much um, for the introduction. And we, uh, I thank everyone for the opportunity to present today. Uh, excited about this um, TISMO application at our um, one of our signature bridges, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Um, and uh, before we um, get into the actual project, I'm gonna take a chance to talk a little bit about um, some TISMO activities that uh, MDTA has um, already undertaken, uh, has been doing for some time, just review those. Um, so that's our current effort. I'll also go over some of our planned efforts. And then finally, I'll turn it over to uh, Jeremy to discuss the uh, project in detail. So on the right of the screen, you can see uh, a copy of the Maryland uh, Department of Transportation State Highway Administration TISMO strategic plan, uh, which was from 2018. Uh, that's something that MDTA collaborated on, but um, MDTA does not have an adopted TISMO strategic plan at this time. Um, but essentially, we follow the same basic tenants um, that are contained in that plan and you know, with the goal of uh, effectively managing and operating our existing facilities or systems to their fullest potential. So we want to use TISMO strategies uh, to the, uh, address issues of uh, capacity limitations, both recurring and non-recurring through various business processes, our ITS technologies, and then collaboration with partners um, in, in, uh, our, on our roadways. So before I get into that, I'll just um, introduce you to uh, MDTA. So the Maryland Transportation Authority was established back in 1971, and uh, we own, operate, construct, and maintain um, the state's eight toll facilities, which are spread out um, across the state from north to south. Um, those eight toll facilities include two tunnels, um, four bridges, and two uh, interstate highways or uh, highways. And so uh, the key thing about MDTA's projects are that we are uh, fully funded by um, our toll revenues. Uh, so we do not um, receive any uh, state tax dollars. Okay, next. Our current efforts um, on TISMO activities at MDTA include uh, a numerous uh, applications such as uh, roadway weather information systems. Um, we have fleet tracking for our maintenance vehicles. We have two 24-7 operation centers. Um, we have our own fleet of motor assistance or vehicle recovery um, teams. We have incident detection systems for our tunnels, for our Bay Bridge. Um, we have some time of day pricing uh, for managed facilities. We have a, a managed toll lane facility, express toll lane facility, as well as a complete 
managed uh, highway, uh, which is uh, all based on time of day pricing. We also um, are participating in the Maryland um, CAV effort. And we also uh, are a strong, uh, or have an active, very strong active presence on social media in order to get information out. Okay, next. So a little detail on some of our current efforts. Um, we have, as I said, um, two facilities that are currently all electronic um, managed facilities. So as I said, we have a time of day pricing that's on Maryland 200 is the, known as the ICC. It's outside of Washington. And then also we have a portion of I-95 that uh, contains express toll lanes. Uh, that's to the northeast of Baltimore. Uh, the current system is about seven miles. Um, as, you, as you can see in the second bullet, we have a, a program where we're undertaking the expansion of of that system. So we'll expand the managed lanes northbound on 95 um, to a, an additional 10 miles. So that's a, a, a very large program for us. It's a $1.1 billion program that's currently in construction uh, with some projects uh, with the remainder of those following up in design right now. Um, as I said, we'll have 10 miles of two lane ETLs. Uh, we'll also be uh, reconstruct, fully reconstructing two interchanges in that stretch. We have five uh, overpasses that get reconstructed. Um, and as well, we have six noise walls. So a, a very large, significant project for us that's um, uh, expanding our electronic, uh, all electronic uh, managed facilities. We also, as I said, are uh, delving into the connected and autonomous vehicles. Uh, so we uh, three years ago, we started a, a dedicated short range uh, communications DSRC deployment uh, at our at our tunnels. So we had installed four uh, radars, roadside units at each of the, the tunnel portals in Baltimore City uh, with the goal of, of um, getting some uh, expertise, some some feedback under our under our belt, some experience with with the technology and um, that project or that pilot has matured and we are looking to sort of turn that into a uh, cellular uh, pilot in the near future. Next. Okay, another large effort um, in TISMO is with some of our very uh, significant Significant uh, maintenance of traffic efforts in, on our on our large projects. So, uh, one of the projects that I'll highlight over the next couple slides is the I-895 bridge replacement project. Uh, in that project, we uh, designed and included an active tra traffic management system into that project to so help with uh, manage the demand, and we also um, had to. To undergo a lot of coordination uh, with emergency response and traffic incident management uh, for that project. Next slide. So as you can see, here's a, a map of the city of Baltimore and that um, large red shape in the, in the center there, that's the uh, project area for the 895 bridge replacement. Um, it's on I-895 through the city of Baltimore. Uh, the MDTA also operates the tunnel there uh, shown just uh, above that, which is the Fort McHenry tunnel, which carries I-95 uh, through the city. And then we also have a bridge down in the lower right, the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Um, that's part of the Baltimore Beltway, uh, I-695 around Baltimore. Uh, but back to the, the I-895 bridge project, that was a $189 million project that was going to replace our only structurally deficient bridge. Uh, what made it uh, difficult was that it's within the city. Uh, it's a four lane um, uh, bridge that goes underneath of I-95 and also it uh, abuts the, the tunnel itself. So the tunnel is a two board tunnel that carries those four lanes uh, under the under the Patapsco River. Um, so the, the 895 carries approximately 80,000 vehicles a day. It had 
uh, peak hour volumes of 3,400. And um, the other part of this is that 895 is a throughway, so it has partial interchanges in this uh, in this area. So um, it was very difficult. Once you're on the facility, it's difficult to get off until you've passed through this work zone. Uh, so we wanted to employ a system that would uh, help to manage that demand. Um, and so on the right side of the screen, uh, is a shot of the uh, web-based dashboard uh, for the system, for the traffic demand system. And uh, on the bottom right is uh, a visual of, of the portable variable message signs uh, that comprise the system. And that was for the driver information. And the system had uh, 13 of those deployed on various roadways leading uh, to the I-895 facility. Um, and the information that fed that system was from six portable traffic sensors that were deployed uh, in advance of the, the work area in both directions. So uh, because of the nature of the facility, uh, incident management was critical. Um, because as I said, once you're on the facility, it's very difficult to get you off unless you've passed through the work zone. So we had to um, have uh, a series of major incident management planning uh, meetings with um, MDTA police. We have our own police force, but we had to meet with the Baltimore City Fire Department. Uh, we have our, again, our, our VRTs, our vehicle recovery folks. Um, uh, we had operations in Baltimore City as well as trucking associations um, because this is near to the port. Um, so you can see on this graphic that uh, during the major phases of construction, the uh, roadway was reduced to a single lane in each direction, uh, which because of the, the demand on the system, uh, in order to not have significant uh, queues exceeding four miles uh, every day, we had to try to get 40% diversion. So the uh, when we... Um, even with that diversion, we knew we were going to have uh, considerable traffic. And if we had a, a single breakdown in this area, it was going to uh, result in significant uh, delays and issues with folks um, stuck in the tunnel or stuck on the um, approach roadways. So we devised plans with our partners in order to um, handle this. We signed detours. We considered anything that we uh, thought would be more than a 15 minute incident, we considered it major, which led to um, closing closing the facility um, in order to uh, maintain mobility around in the area. Okay, next slide. So an additional effort that we have is uh, the facility management of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge itself. So that's a very significant um, bridge for us. It's uh, right outside our state capital, Annapolis. It's four miles in length. It's two spans. Um, and so uh, their spans are starting to get up there in age. Uh, the initial span was opened in the 50s and the second span was opened in the 70s. Um, so there's a lot of work it takes to maintain those facilities. And so we have to plan those works well in advance. So uh, on the right, you can see a chart where we track um, every project upcoming for the next 15 years, and we lay out the type of um, impact this will have to the lane. So whether it's a overnight uh, lane closure, it's uh, work from underneath the bridge, uh, various um, types of work we categorize those here and analyze those for impacts so that we can maintain traffic while we're uh, keeping the bridges operational. Uh, next. So the way that we do that, we have daily coordination meetings once, um, once contracts are in the field. Um, the example calendar on the right is uh, something we include in our contract documents for bid. Uh, it, um, identifies for the contractor that the limits to their uh, access for every month of the upcoming years. And uh, we also lay out an expectation of cancellations. Um, 
because they can be as high as 60% depending on um, the time of year. And uh, we, get, we get fog and rain and snow and wind, all of which subject, uh, subject this to uh, not being able to perform work out there. And our last tool that we use here is a uh, website, a scheduler website, whereby um, all of construction and active contractors can log on to this and submit lane, uh, lane closure requests. And so it's an easy way to organize um, the requests that are there and also to identify opportunities uh, for uh, the contractors to get their work done. Now I'll talk a little bit about our, our planned efforts. Um, so uh, we have our conversion to all electronic tolling at our facilities. So um, in March of uh, this year, um, we began to collect, uh, we, we went all cashless because of the, uh, the pandemic. So we, we completely went over to cashless uh, at all of our facilities immediately in March. And then in this August, the Governor Hogan announced that we would permanently go to all electronic tolling. So we uh, were partially underway with some of the conversions at our um, seven traditional plazas. So we have currently now four facilities that are under construction, converting those to all electronic tolling facilities, removing the traditional toll plazas and, and lanes. Uh, and then we have planning and design underway at the three remaining facilities. Um, another effort that we have is our I-95 southbound part-time shoulder use. So it's a new project that's just starting to enter design. This project will be southbound near to the um, previously mentioned uh, toll lane, ex uh, express toll lane extension. Uh, that was the managed lanes on 995. This will run in the opposite direction. Um, it's going to provide seven miles of actively managed uh, shoulder use during uh, peak seasonal periods. Um, and then our last thing is a, uh, a Bay Bridge queue detection system. So uh, it's an integrated system uh, utilizing cameras and radar detectors uh, to monitor queues on the approach to the, our Bay Bridge. Um, we're working with the University of Maryland to develop a system that will uh, monitor the flow and the queue lanes. You use that data and historical data to inform uh, contractors and operations of the expected conditions on the bridge. That will help us uh, manage those work windows more efficiently. And so at this point, I'm um, going to turn it over to talk about the, uh, the highlighted project of the automated lane closure system at our bridge. So Jeremy, take it away. Thank you, Jim. Uh, as, as Jim mentioned, uh, TISMO is continuing to evolve at MDTA. And we want to spotlight a project here, and that's the Chesapeake Bay Bridge crossover automated lane closure system. So those of you who are not familiar with the uh, Bay Bridge, its formal name is the William Preston Lane Jr. Memorial Bridge. It carries uh, US 5301 uh, to connect uh, the metro areas of Baltimore, Annapolis, and DC to the uh, Maryland's Eastern Shore. Um, they're four miles long, as Jim mentioned, and they're some of the world's longest and most scenic overwater structures. I think the, the key point here is that this is a vital link uh, in the state of Maryland. Uh, the detours associated with uh, to if this structure was closed, uh, you know, 45 miles to the north and 140 miles to the south. So obviously, it's a it's a vital link in uh, Maryland's transportation network. Just to reiterate what Jim said, the the original span was opened in 1952 as a two lane roadway, which typically serves eastbound traffic today. Uh, the parallel structure opened in 1973 has three lanes for westbound traffic on a, on a typical operation. Uh, the key thing here, though, is that it provides for five lanes on the bridge, but the approaches are six lanes. And so what that causes is a need for two-way traffic operations. Uh, there's, there's a very heavy um, directional movement on the bridge for commuting uh, in, in non-seasonal times. And the PM, uh, there's, a, there's a 
regular switch to two-way traffic operations to get three lanes eastbound, as well as for uh, incidents and constructions on the bridge. So th that, that two-way traffic operations, which is a recurring need on the bridge, is really set up the purpose and need for the automated lane closure system, the ALCS project. And so this was a, a request from the MDTA police. They wanted to decrease the lane closure uh, setup time to get into contraflow operations, which would allow for uh, a decrease in time to respond to incidents, as well as provide a safer so in, in order to meet that purpose and need, uh, MDTA engineering developed a concept for the Eastern Shore crossover. And this concept looked at developing a remote operated lane closure system to replace personnel having to respond for temporary traffic control device deployment of signs and cones, et cetera. So the ALCS system, it's, it's, an, it's a system of integrated ITS devices that advises of closed lanes approaching the two-way traffic crossovers and allows operations and maintenance staff at the bridge to remotely close these lanes for contraflow operations on the north or south bridges uh, to meet peak eastbound capacity needs, uh, incidents, and construction on the bridge. Uh, as, the, as the ALCS project was going through design on the eastern shore, uh, it was another project was coming uh, into the design and for all electronic tolling, as uh, Jim had mentioned, and it was decided to add ALCS for the Western Shore crossover as well, so that both of the two-way crossovers on each shore of the bridge will allow for uh, automated lane closure uh, operations. So as I mentioned, the ALCS system, it's, a, it's an integrated ITS uh, system of devices, and those devices include en enhanced lane use signals, uh, DMS for ALCS warning messages, variable arm length, horizontal swing gates, and illuminated pavement markers. Uh, the, the table there shows the number of devices uh, on each shore of the bridge. Um, but one thing to distinguish the lane use signal messages for the, the term enhanced was used because there's an existing lane use control signal system on the bridge. But as uh, this system was going through the, uh, the design phase, the stakeholders agreed that we really needed to augment the messaging and extend it further on the approaches uh, since we will be employing these, you know, first of its kind deployment in Maryland of, uh, of this system. And so these enhanced lane use signal messages, the term was used to differentiate these from the existing lane use control signals on the bridge. Um, as I'll get in more detail, these messages, uh, these, these signs are twice the size of the existing and have uh, full uh, message capabilities. And then at the, at the bottom right there, the graphic shows um, DMS warning messages that can be displayed for the various uh, ALCS uh, configurations. Additional project elements associated uh, with the ALCS system was we replaced all the existing lane use control gantries and static sign structures on the shores, as well as adding additional gantries to increase notification of lane use control uh, as you approach the bridge. Uh, there's traffic barrier replacement and installation, uh, signing and marking upgrades, uh, the mains of traffic associated with all these improvements, electrical modifications. Obviously, with this type of ITS deployment, uh, there's definitely a high demand for uh, electrical power, uh, and we had to coordinate with an existing uh, 5kV electrical power upgrade project that was ongoing at the bridge. Uh, stormwater management, ENS, uh, landscaping, as well as testing, commissioning, and integration to integrate these, this system into the existing Bay Bridge traffic control system. To get into a little more detail about the devices, uh, as I mentioned, we use the term enhanced lane use signals because these signals are full matrix color DMSs. Uh, they're approximately five feet by five feet by uh, six inches thick. Um, these are the ones used for the lane use uh, control messages, as well as we also had DMSs that were full color matrix DMS for warning messages to alert drivers to the various contraflow conditions they could be coming upon. Uh, we did evaluate multiple types and vendors during the design process. Um, and through that selection with our stakeholders, uh, the basis of design products were from the Dactronics Vanguard product line. The next device that was critical in this, in the ALCS system is the horizontal swing gates. This is really the, you know, the, the second critical element to replace the cones today that, that guide drivers through the the crossovers and open and closed lanes. Um, we evaluated multiple types and vendors, both vertical and horizontal swing gates. Um, ultimately through um, a 
a, a series of evaluations with our stakeholders, um, it was decided to select the Brasilis horizontal swing gate product. And some of the key factors that really uh, weighed in the de decision here was the, uh, the MASH crash testing that was provided by this product, as well as the wind loading of 65 to 95 miles an hour um, for this product. Kind of the, the third device in this system um, is, that we talk about is the illuminated pavement markers. And the, these are four runs of markers that are for two runs for each direction of traffic that guide people through that, that last point of the crossover. Since you can't have, it's hard to have conflicting uh, static pavement markings on the ground for these um, directional movements that have to cross each other. These, these illuminated pavement markers will allow the operations you know, to be activated for the operational pattern uh, that's needed. And so we evaluated multiple types and vendors and ultimately selected the uh, Hilltech LED line Sun DV product, uh, which is a semi-directional optics with 12 LED diodes. It's fully submersible encapsulated and corrosion resistant aluminum mounting plate with the highest rated uh, you know, watertight connectors. You know, to talk about benefits of this project, obviously increasing safety, the, the goal is to, you know, reduce crashes that could be associated with these, the lane closures for set up in the two-way, uh, allow for superior incident response, as well as a safer work environment for employees. As Jim mentioned, uh, MDTA is a toll agency and, you know, reven all projects are um, funded through the revenues derived. And so MDTA takes, uh, you know, treats their customers, you know, with the highest regard. And so looking at the benefits to customers from DTA, this, the, the goal is to have less, one of the benefits is less setup time. This should reduce congestion and queuing associated with the current manual lane closure operations, as well as providing advance notice for incidents, which should continue to reduce congestion and queuing um, associated with late lane changing, as well as increasing reliability. Operational benefits, this, is, this project looks to free up time for maintenance personnel to perform other uh, facility maintenance activities on, this, uh, on these aging structures, as Jim mentioned, as well as reducing setup time for lane closure uh, operations to go into two-way. Since this is a first-of-a-kind deployment in the state of Maryland, uh, outreach was important to the stakeholders. And so MDTA commissioned production of a video visualization. Um, as part of that visualization, uh, the company that produced it uh, created a model that allows you to pan, go, go in a bird's eye view and, and actually fly through the project uh, to see different elements of the project. And this was very, this was very well received internally within MDTA for the various stakeholders within operations, maintenance, and um, senior management to understand how this project could work, as well as uh, being used for public outreach which will become more important now as these projects um, are both in construction and will be going into operation uh, several years from now. So these videos um, modeled for the key operation plans. Operation plan A is, is one of the most common, which is two-way traffic on the North Bridge uh, with normal traffic on the South Bridge, which is also similar to if the eastbound bridge had to be closed and two-way traffic was on the westbound bridge. Ops plan B is, uh, the North Bridge is closed with two-way traffic on the South Bridge. And then Ops Plan C and D are kind of the, the because of the, the capability provided with the gates to get into Ops Plan A and B, we had the ability to do basically a two left lane closure or a two right lane closure on the North Bridge, which is Ops Plan C and D. Um, so what I'm gonna try to do here is switch over and actually we looped together a video of three of the um, Ops Plans into a five minute video see if I can get that to uh, play here. Unfortunately, the, uh, the music that accompanied it, the, uh, the audio was not working here uh, today to play through, but I'll let you, uh, you know, take a chance to look at this video. While this is going, Ross, I'll let you know this is about five minutes long, so we'll be coming right up to the end. So if you want to stop it to get questions in, feel free to jump in. So,
Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, you can keep rolling with the video. Right now, we don't have any additional questions at this time, so we'll, we'll keep going with the video until we get some more questions. Thank you, Ross. Jeremy, while we're watching the video, it looks like a few questions have been coming in. We could probably just do the questions while the video is playing in the background. Works for me. Okay. So the first question here was, any insight into installation of the LED strips? How are they powered? So they are inductively powered. And so uh, one way to think about it, it's almost like a um, loop detector type installation. And if, so if you had a long lead, line basically they will have to saw cut um, to install the actual strip itself and then there's a line that runs along with it and depending on how many you loop together you have to then um, that lead in has to then cut into the shoulder into it into a hand hole and then you can kind of connect the next series and so um, I think as traffic engineers we're used to loop detection it signals it's kind of very similar to that type of uh, installation um, and so this product, to our knowledge, it's one of the first times being used on in a roadway application like this. Um, it's been used um, at airports before. And one of the other applications was interesting. The, the vendor was working with us. Um, it was selected by the U.S. Navy. They use it in um, submarines in the um, in the hatch when they have to have recovery vehicles. And that's an area that gets fully flooded with water. And they needed a product that was capable of withstanding pressurized, fully submersible, you know, applications. And uh, and this product is, is used in that application as well. So. Excellent. Thanks for that. Jeremy, one other question. Do you know what software was used to generate this model? That is a good question. So we um, we worked with a vendor um, through one of our sub consultants and um, I do not know the name of the software off the top of my head. This video was produced over a year ago now. Um, but I will say it, it, it's funny. They actually used an engine, they called it. The software they used was very similar to how they um, develop uh, games, based video games, basically. And so the model that they created is very similar to uh, many video games that uh, either <laughs> we or our children might be playing right now. And um, it allows you to basically, um, it's a real world almost where you can then, you can fly in, change the angle of your view. You can create your own videos, you can pause it. And so um, I'd have to uh, check if someone was really interested, I can look into what the actual software was used, so. Thanks, Jeremy. I, I know we're getting close here on time, folks. So if you have any other questions, please send them in the Q&A feature. Okay, all done, Ross, thank you. All right, well, thanks, Jeremy, and thank you, Jim, for this presentation. And visualization was great, but it really helps kind of explain and really depict 
the extent of the project and, and all the different devices that were included with it. So I just want to thank you guys again. And then also Mike and Scott for your presentation. I uh, really appreciate it. We did give one last I guess, comment more or less in the Q&A. And that was from Rusillis is that, you know, visit them in the exhibit hall to learn more about the automated warning gate system. So they have a system as well. So please go out and, and check them out in the exhibitor hall. And Ross, it looks like we have one more question there as well from oh, Chris Robbins. Okay, thank you. It says, when do you expect the system to be fully implemented? So um, we just are wrapping up our first season of construction um, and we anticipate that this, uh, the, what was shown in the video is the Eastern shore um, westbound direction that would be implemented in early 22, 2022. And the other side of the uh, bridge uh, will be about six months behind. So fall of 22. Awesome. Thanks for that, Jim. Appreciate that catch. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any other questions before we wrap up? All right, not seeing anything. Um, thank you again to our speakers today and hope everyone enjoyed the conference and we'll see you all again tomorrow. Thanks, Ross. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone.